knows, has an idea of what, what is onboarding? Can anybody tell me what their definition of onboarding is? Joining. Joining. Okay, anybody else? Um, an introduction. An introduction, yeah. A crash anybody course. Else? Crash course. Leading your customer from tip to tail, basically, just getting them Starting them as a lead, maybe bringing them through a sales funnel, and then integrating them, maybe with nice. a website or services yep. or something like that. Perfect. So here is why I'm smiling from here to here now. You guys didn't say any of the things that I was going to have to say. No, that's not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is that you've got a really good idea of what it is. So every service provider, every person who starts a business, doesn't start a business with the goal of giving crappy client service. Right? Everybody who starts a business, who's in the client services, their goal is to deliver extraordinary client service. Right? To have your clients have such an amazing experience that they want to give you a fantastic testimonial and they want to refer their friends, their family, and their network to you. So you don't have to work as hard to get new business. But you want to create an experience that's memorable. One that makes them think, I'm so glad I hired this person. This was the best decision I could have possibly made for my business. Now, creating that kind of experience starts with onboarding. It begins with the process of bringing the client into your business. Now, there's a lot of confusion about onboarding, which is where I get really frustrated and why I was super, super happy with all of your answers. Because onboarding lately, when I first started talking about it, nobody was talking. And now, everybody seems to be talking about it, and there's blog posts all over the internet that talk about onboarding, and then when you read them, they're talking about portfolios, and they're talking about uh, ways to attract clients and get them into your business, and they're talking about sales. Onboarding is not about your portfolio. Onboarding is not about sales. It's not about testimonials and case studies. Right? It's not about any of those things. If you think about where the idea of onboarding really comes from, the most, the most common place we hear people talk about it is in new employee onboarding. Right? Onboarding an employee, getting them up to speed. You're not going to spend time onboarding someone you haven't hired yet. Right? That's, that's not going to happen. So you're not going to spend time onboarding a client who hasn't paid you yet. So onboarding begins once you've been paid. It begins when the client signs the contract, they pay their deposit, and you're ready to get started. So any business, no matter what industry you're in, whether you're a designer, a developer, you write content, you're blogging, or you're in a completely different industry, can benefit from creating automated systems and processes to support onboarding. When you can automate these systems, it frees you up to do more meaningful work, the strategic work that your clients are actually paying you for, instead of chasing you down, chasing down all kinds of little details. So before we dive into actually creating a system like that, I want to talk a little bit about what onboarding is. So you have an idea of that. So it's basically the concept of getting a new client up to speed so they can be a great client. It is gathering the information that you need so you can work together effectively, so that you can mitigate risk, you can eliminate obstacles, right? And so you can have a really good relationship with your client. Where client relationships go bad, when clients start to get frustrated, when things start to go wrong on projects, it's usually from mismanagement of expectations and a communication breakdown. And effective onboarding can help avoid all of that. So there's this quote that I love, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And this is especially true in client services. Eventually down the road, two, three years after someone hires you, they may not remember the exact scope of work of what you did, but they're gonna remember if you made them feel like what they had to say was important. They're gonna remember if you listened to them. They're gonna remember how they felt during the process and if they trusted you. Right? They're going to remember that kind of experience, and that's what's going to drive referrals. So during the onboarding process, new clients 
and yourself, right? The onboarding process isn't just about new clients, it's about your client and it's about yourself because it has to benefit you both, otherwise why are you gonna do it, right? So new clients get the training, the education, and the information they need to be a good client. You get the information that you need. You get the knowledge that you need to be able to deliver a really high quality, fantastic project and experience for the client. So onboarding is all about setting expectations and boundaries. I mentioned that a failure set of expectations can derail projects down the road with clients. A good onboarding system sets really clear expectations so the client knows exactly what's coming, what's happening now, what's coming next, and what they can expect from you, what you expect of them. And it also sets boundaries so clients know when you're going to respond and when you won't, how long it might be before you respond to, to a message of theirs, right? What the boundaries are in terms of cost, timeline, and those types of things. So there are three uh, core areas to focus on when you're setting expectations and boundaries during, during onboarding. The first is what your clients can expect of you, right? What they can expect of you as the service provider and the expert they hire as their guide through this project. The other is availability. So what's the best form of communication? When should they reach out to you? How should they reach out to you? Uh, what are the turnaround times? Uh, like one of my boundaries are if you see the little light on this and I'm on the screen, it doesn't mean that you can pick, you know, ping me through Messenger and I'm going to respond, right? That's, that's not how I do business. So one of my boundaries is we don't use social media to communicate about business. If you have a need of the project that we're at, then you reach out by email or by phone, not through Facebook Messenger, not through Twitter direct message, and not through Instagram direct message. What about LinkedIn? Not through LinkedIn direct message. Social media is not a form of project communication for us, right? So that's a boundary there. And then also, how communication and revisions and approval, how those things are going to work. Clients want to know, how do revisions work? How, what happens when I give design approval? How does that process work? What does that mean? What kind of constraints are there? Right? They want to know these things because what it does is it puts them at ease. Right? It makes them feel more confident in your abilities and it helps them stop second guessing your work. Mm -hmm. So onboarding also sets the project tone. Right? If you start the project uh, and there isn't a lot of communication, things are unclear, the client's having to reach out and say, hey, I, I signed my contract and paid my deposit and <laughs> it hurt from you. Like that's setting a tone for the project that they're like, I gotta watch this person. And they're gonna second guess you, and they're gonna reach out, and they're gonna bug you, and they're gonna try to micromanage things, and they're gonna drive you crazy, right? But if you set the tone from the very beginning that you're the expert they hire, you're the leader of the project, you're gonna guide them through this project, you're gonna support them along the way, and they can trust you to do that, then the project's gonna go smoother, you're gonna encounter less hurdles, and your projects are gonna be more profitable. You're gonna make more money because there's gonna be less back and forth and less babysitting. Onboarding is also about client education and value delivery uh, and information and discovery gathering. So uh, one of the things when I first implemented an onboarding system in my business, I think it was the end of 2010, um, and the very first time a client said, this was so amazing, I feel like I already got all my money's worth. I was like, we haven't even started your project yet. Mm -hmm. But I'll totally take it, right? Because that right there, they were already a raving fan, and it was up to me to lose that feeling, right? It was up to me, as long as I continue to do a great job, I knew they were going to refer tons of business to me, right? So the bottom line is that client onboarding is just a fancy name for getting clients educated. It's for getting them up to speed so that they're ready to work with you, they're prepared to work with you, they can be a great client. So there are two parts to a successful onboarding experience. Uh, lots of people talk about uh, one of them, almost nobody talks about the other, but we're gonna cover both tonight. So it's internal onboarding and external onboarding. So external onboarding is what the client sees. Right, it's the outward facing part of your onboarding process. It's the, the things that the client experiences. So welcoming the client into your business, explaining your process and how you work, and setting expectations, educating 
the client so that they can be savvy enough to communicate well with you and feel confident in their communications with you. Uh, adding value and adding surprises in there that make them think, dang, I'm glad I had this person. This was totally worth every penny that I spent. Uh, and providing them the questionnaire to provide you the information that you need on the project. Internal onboarding, on the other hand, is stuff the client never sees. It's the internal behind the scenes stuff that happens in your business to help you do your job better. So it's CRM documentation and tagging, right? When a new client comes in, uh, when we originally set this up uh, in our business, when a new client signed the contract and paid the deposit, the deposit payment triggered tags being added. They got added to the CRM system and then they were tagged with what they bought. <coughs> Uh, they were tagged with client, holiday gift. Uh, they were tagged with a bunch of things, but it was automated through, uh, through software. So you wanna look at what do you need to tag them with? How do you need to get them set up in your CRM system? Uh, what are the welcome and kickoff tasks that need to happen, right? For us, in addition to a welcome email, I send a handwritten note card. But I tell you what, digging out with that client's uh, mailing address when I'm not the person that gets the contracts was not super fun for me. So what we did is set that up in uh, in software. When the client signs the contract and pays their deposit, I get emailed the note that says, "Client A just signed their contract. Here's their mailing address. Send them a thank you note." Right. So I didn't have to do anything except check my email and be like, "Oh, I gotta write that note," and I write it really quick and pop it in the mail. Right, so these are the internal things that your clients might not see, but are going to help add value and enhance their experience. Adding them into your project management system, so we use Basecamp. Getting their project installed into Basecamp, the to-dos and the things associated with their project. Uh, completing initial project tasks for websites, that was setting up the development account. Uh, getting those types of internal things done so that later down the road when the client's like, it's approved and we're really busy and we're like, ah, I've got to spin up that account, I've got to install WordPress, I've got to get all those things set up. Uh, we do it all right up front so it's prepared and ready. It's less stress when you're in the midst of all things. Uh, and then reminders. Reminders to check in with the client, reminders if you haven't heard from them in a certain amount of time, reminders that are appropriate for your services and your business uh, that you're offering. So, Let's talk a little bit about how to actually create an onboarding system, because it's easy to talk about, um, but it's a little harder to actually set up. So uh, when I first implemented this in my business, um, I implemented automated systems to run every aspect of my business from, from the sales call all the way through post-launch follow-up. Uh, but onboarding was the very first thing I did. So I set up an onboarding process because it was drowning um, my business was growing way faster than, uh, than, we could, than we could manage. Brian worked with me for a really long time. Um, it was growing way faster than we could manage, and I don't know if you've ever found yourself in this situation, but if you focus on doing the client work, then you lose sales because you're not responding fast enough, but if you focus on all the sales stuff, then you don't have to. And onboarding was one of the ways that I solved that was setting up an automated system that could run that when a client signed their contract, my onboarding process took, uh, it takes eight days. So for eight days, the client's being served and delivered value and communicated with and educated and loved on. And I'm not doing jack because I'm busy doing work on other things. It's all automated. And I tell them it's automated and they're still like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, but it saved me 50% of the admin time in my business, which is why I then went and did the same thing for the design and development and the, and the marketing processes. Um, I love this quote, all things are created twice, mentally and physically. The key is to begin with the end in mind with a vision and a blueprint of the desired result. So a lot of times we think about all these things that we can do in our business, but we don't ever do them. Uh, but we do everything twice, right? We think about it and then we actually do it. But a lot of times we think about it and we start taking action, but we haven't thought through it completely. So if you've thought about doing, uh, implementing an onboarding system in your business, we're gonna help you think through all the things today so you can think backwards and make sure that you kind of reverse engineer your system to fit your clients and your business. So systems and processes in your business matter. Um, I don't sell websites as much, much anymore, probably actually not at all, um, this year, uh, but, 
But for the past 13 years, uh, I owned an agency selling websites, and systems and processes were the only way that we were able to grow and continue to remain profitable uh, with the amount of work and, uh, and the clients that we had. So systems and processes allow you to grow no matter how big your team. They allow you to either bring on more work or make more money. One of the things we had to decide when we automated uh, things like onboarding in our business, again, it reduced that admin time by 50%. So then you have to ask yourself, with that 50% of your time, what are you going to do? Are you going to take on more work so you can make more money? Or are you going to make the same amount of money and do less work and go have more fun? And that's a decision that you get to make when you implement systems in your business. So an onboarding system is proven to increase confidence and satisfaction to improve productivity and performance because you're interrupted less because of the plans being taken care of. And to reduce stress and confusion for both you and your client, right? Because everybody knows exactly what's going on, where they're at, what's coming next, and what they need to do. So the very first step in creating an onboarding process is figuring out what you actually have to include in that onboarding campaign, right? What needs to be a part of it? So the goal here is to provide the client tools and information and resources that they need to reduce uncertainty, to make the process clearer. Because when clients feel uncomfortable and they don't feel confident and they aren't sure what to say, like I've had clients in the past that didn't ask questions because they just didn't want to admit they didn't know the answer, and then it caused bigger problems down the road. Right, so what kind of tools and things could you provide to your clients to make that process easier? So you want to ask your client, what do you need to know, or you want to think about when you're talking about your clients, what do they need to know, what do they need to learn, and what do they need to do? What do you need to do, and how can you add value to their experience? And these questions are what guides the creation of your onboarding process. So at the very beginning, when you think about what do your clients need to know, one of the things that I realized my clients need to know is the right vocabulary, a tab, there are no tabs in your video. Most clients don't even know that the WordPress navigation, the, the navigation on your website is called a menu. Right? They say tabs, you say menu. They say weird things, and you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then they show it to you, and you're like, oh, this? And then they feel like I, maybe they should have known that, and it creates an uncomfortable thing, and maybe they feel like, well, that was done. And you never want your client to feel like, like they should have known things, something. You never want your client to feel um, that, they, that they don't know enough or to feel dumb, right? Because these are technical things. You do it every day, they don't do it every day. So one of the things that I realized early on is I need to provide my clients some education about terminology, a glossary of terms. These are, the, these are things that I might say during our project. This is what they need. So providing them a glossary of terms immediately helped them understand what we were talking about better. I had things where I would make recommendations to clients. Uh, when you talk about what your clients need to learn, we would talk about different things and we'd make design recommendations. They'd say, well, I don't even know what that's for. Like, why would I need to do that? And I have this formulization that most clients have no idea what different parts of your website are for or how they're used or why they're done a certain way. And so I put together a resource called the Anatomy of the WordPress site. And it just, with screenshots and examples, broke down every single part of the website, what it is, what it's used for, what the strategy is, what they should consider when they're working on their website, and put that together so we could give that to the client, and they could take a look at that, and then be better educated when they're talking to us, and say, hey, I looked at this thing, when we're talking about this, right, and allow me to have better conversations with clients. So you want to think about what do they need to know, process, expectations, all of those things, what do they need to learn, what do clients need to do? Right? When they sign a contract, what do you need them to do? Most of the time, it's fill out a discovery questionnaire, right, to give you information. How many people have sent clients a discovery questionnaire and not come back for like two weeks? Or they kind of chase it down? Yeah, if you're not raising your hand, come on now. What I realized is clients were taking forever to figure it out because they didn't know how to answer the questions. By providing your clients better education up front and providing the discovery questionnaire at the end of onboarding instead of at the beginning, you can educate them enough that when they have to answer all those questions, they already know how to answer them. 
and then you end up getting your, your discovery questionnaire back faster, which saves you time because you're not having to chase it down, you're not having to face the client, you're not having to ask, how come this isn't done? And when you get it back, you get it back with better answers that allow you to do a better job serving them and create a better product. These things add value, right? Clients aren't necessarily expecting that. Uh, when you provide them education and training, ebooks, bonuses, things like that, they're the opportunity to surprise and delight your clients and add more value and again, reinforce the fact that hiring you was a really good decision. So ultimately, when you're talking about onboarding, you have to know what you want to achieve. And for us, looking at onboarding, I want my clients to know what to expect so we're both clear. I want them to have clear boundaries on how they can engage with us. And I want them to feel confident and comfortable in their communication with us so they can ask questions and they feel like they have uh, open communication with us. So the benefits here of doing this, fewer revisions and changes Right? I don't know about you, but the fewer revisions I make, the more money I make. Right? The more rounds of revisions you make, the lower your dollar per hour, unless you're working hourly. But still, that's a terrible experience. <clears throat> right? So my goal is to get, to get to design approval as fast as possible. And with better education, I can do that. To gather trust and understanding. We talked about that a little bit earlier, that when clients <laughs> trust you to be their guide, they don't second guess you. They listen to you, they trust you, and they do what you say. They take your recommendations, right? A client who is happy that they hired you tells their friends about you. Onboarding also lets you provide better client care and support. I told you at the very beginning that what I started hearing back from clients was they felt like they'd gotten all the value out of their investment with us before I even started building their website. Because they learn so much during onboarding and they gain so much clarity about their business going through the onboarding process and filling out that discovery questionnaire that they felt like was already worth the investment and I hadn't even built the website yet. So those happier clients, right, as a result of that better care <coughs> that you can automate so you don't even have to deliver it yourself. And again, improved work product. We started producing better work because we were interrupted less. There was less time chasing around the clients so we could spend more time working on strategy and more time working on things that were going to move the client closer to achieving their goals. So the second thing that you want to consider when you're setting up your onboarding process is actually outlining the process and creating the content itself. Uh, I shared with you my onboarding process is uh, eight days. The client gets one email from me every day for eight days. The last day is, uh, is the discovery questionnaire. Um, well, maybe it's nine. I think they get like bonuses after that. But roughly, it's eight days uh, with an email every day, and every day is a different goal. Set expectations, provide education, help them learn what they need to learn to be able to fill out that discovery questionnaire. But once you decide what they need to learn, what they need to know, what they need to do, then it's about creating that content. So you want to think about when you're creating the content for your onboarding system, what you're going to provide to your clients. You want to think about what order should that content be in so it makes the most sense? What order should it be in so that it simplifies the process as much as possible and it reduces the amount of work that clients have to do? And that you ideally you want each thing that you provide them to build on the thing prior. Right? So they start with something basic and then you step it up a little bit and then you step it up a little bit until you get to that discovery questionnaire. You want to also look at how do I make this as easy as possible for somebody to understand? When you do this every day, it's easy when you're creating content to make assumptions that your clients have a certain level of understanding that they may not have. So one of the things that I did when I created my initial onboarding process was I wrote all the emails, I created all the content, and then I went and found people that I knew and I said, I need you to pretend to be a client and go through this process. I need you to go through this onboarding process, get every email, read every single one over the course of a week. And every time you get one, I need you to A, read it and check for typos, um, B, read it and tell me anything that you don't understand. If there's a word that you don't know what it means, if there's a sentence you don't understand, if there's something in there that's confusing to you, 
tell me so I can rewrite it. And I had six people go through that process, uh, one with absolutely zero level of any technical knowledge whatsoever, barely uses the internet for anything, uh, all the way to another, another designer who offers the same services I do, a business coach, uh, I think a, a nutritionist, uh, but six completely different types of business owners with six varying levels of technical expertise. So I could make sure that the content I was sending to clients wasn't going to generate more questions. The whole point in automating the onboarding process was to save me time, right? I didn't want to have to say to a new prospect coming in, hey, I totally would love to work with you. I'm going to send you over that contract, but I can't get started for a month. I can't get started for two months. I can't get started for two weeks. I didn't want to even say I can't get started for two weeks. What implementing this in my business allowed me to do, I knew that when the client signed the contract, they were taken care of for eight days without me having to do anything. So instead of saying, I can't get started for two weeks, I could say, sure, I can get started next week. <coughs> because I knew I still had two weeks. I had the entire week that they were onboarding that I could keep finishing the other projects that I had. So it allowed me to shorten my lead time, which helped me close, close contracts faster. Because no client, clients don't want to leave, right? They want things done on their timeline not on your timeline. And then also you want to ask, what do you need to communicate to achieve your goals? Right? What do you need to communicate to your clients? And that's what you want to put into that content. So each step of an onboarding campaign, and I choose to deliver my, my email, again, should build upon. So in the very beginning, in the first one, it's welcoming, into the, welcoming them into your business. For me, the second one is, Communicating my process. I might have covered that in a sales call. I might cover that on my website. But guess what clients never do? Remember what you talked about on the sales call? Or visit your website. Um, so it's helpful to remind them of that process. This is how things are going to work, right? So welcoming them in, reminding them of the process, then starting to provide education, right? Each step builds on that with the ultimate goal of helping them provide me really great answers to the questions in my discovery questionnaire and getting it back to me very quickly. The third step is deciding upon how you're gonna deliver your onboarding uh, campaign, how you're gonna deliver this process to your clients. If you've got eBooks, if you've got training videos, if you've got content, Whatever it is, how are you going to provide that to your clients? You have a bevy of options, right? You can invite them into your project management system and you can deliver this content in your project management system. You could create a membership site and invite clients into the membership site and drip that content out through a membership site. You could put it all in a single PDF and give it to them when they join as kind of an onboarding PDF. I choose to do it by email, one email a day, each day for the onboarding campaign. And there is a very strong reason for that, right? Well, I've tried all of these things. I tried just writing canned emails and having them ready and then just sending them to the clients. That's a ridiculous amount of work and I'm all for automation when you can have automation. Uh, I tried email automation, my favorite. Uh, membership site, tried it. PDF welcome magnet, tried it. Software, uh, project management system, tried it too. I uh, implemented the onboarding system in 2010, automated the rest of the process in 2011. I've been using it ever since, and I teach it in a course called Profitable Project Plan. And to date, email is still the absolute best way I have ever tried to implement an onboarding system. And there's a reason for that. Nobody likes email, but everybody checks email every single day. <laughs> right? Nobody likes email, nobody wants more email, nobody wants more crap in their inbox but they still check it every single day. When I put it in a, in a project management system, guess what clients didn't do? Log into the project management system. I put it in a membership site, and I'd say, oh, we've got this membership site, you can log in. They're like, I don't need another thing to log into. Can't you just send it to me? Yep, totally can, right? They just email is easy. Even though they don't like it, it's easy. 
So one of the things that we work with clients on is we say we're going to be emailing you our primary form of communication is email. You're going to get the email from us roughly once a day during each main phase of our projects together. Uh, what we highly recommend that you do is create a folder that says foreign creative and you set up a rule and everything from me goes to that folder and then you look at it at the end of your day, right? Whatever's come in or if you get really busy and you need to catch up on Saturday, you can find everything from me about your project in one place and it's super easy and you don't have to go digging through your email. But email is still the absolute best way to do that. Because again, you check it every day. The very next step is to actually create and test it to work out the kinks. I told you I pulled a focus group together full of people to test mine. I ran them through it. They gave me all kinds of feedback. This word doesn't make sense. This sentence is weird. This thing doesn't make sense. I don't even know what that is. Uh, and then edited it all there. And then what I did once I implemented it, I put it into use with clients, and when it was brand new, I told clients, hey, I'm trying out a new thing. I'm trying out a new thing. I created an onboarding process. It's automated, you're gonna get something from me every day, but could you do me a favor? When you're reading through it, if there's something that doesn't make sense to you, if you have a question, could you let me know? And clients would reach out and say, hey, I have a question about this one thing. And then I'd log into my system and I'd rewrite that one thing. So the next client wouldn't have that question. And I worked on that for about a year. Every time a client came to be feedback, I'd log in, rewrite it, and edit it. Because again, the goal is to have the system run through automation without me and to not have the clients ask any questions, right? Because my goal, I don't know about you, but I don't want to work all day long, every day. And when I am working, I want to be as absolutely productive as humanly possible so I can work fewer hours and make the same amount of Right? I don't want to make less because I'm working less. I want to make the same and work less. Like, everybody talks about making more money. I'm like, I'm good with what I got. I just don't want to work. Sorry. And this, and this let me do that. So, uh, creation and testing reminders. Uh, again, proofread everything carefully, but you're going to miss stuff, right? Because you're the person that, that, that wrote it. So, give yourself some grace, and as clients find things or let you know, just fix it along the way, but make sure you proofread if you have Grammarly or something like that, run your stuff through there. But know that even when you run stuff through Grammarly, it doesn't catch everything. Um, gather a diverse focus group if you can. It works really, really well. And use clients and ask for feedback like I shared with you. Let them know that you're testing things. Clients really, really want to know um, that you value them. They want to know that you value their expertise. So making them part of the process is really helpful. So when testing, your onboarding process with clients. Again, pay attention to the questions that they're asking you, not only to edit and tweak like I mentioned, but your clients are gonna tell you what tools and resources they need by the questions that they ask. They're gonna tell you where they're getting tripped up. They're gonna tell you where they're running into problems. Pay attention in your projects where you're running into hurdles and getting stuck. Like, are you always getting stuck waiting for clients to give you content? Like, is that where your projects stall out and delay because you did everything you were supposed to do and now the client's supposed to create content? Nothing's happening. And that's something that you can address in your systems and your processes. It's something that you can set the tone for and set the stage for in onboarding. And again, as you improve your processes, you want to always be kind of on the lookout for ways that you can improve your onboarding process or other systems and processes. So one of the things that you want to look out for is as you come to meetups like this, as you attend word camps, as you listen to podcasts, or you attend virtual summits or conferences, uh, as you listen to webinars and trainings, you're going to pick up little tips and tricks and tools and things that you can tweak what you're doing to squeeze out a little bit more productivity, squeeze out a little bit more productivity. Uh, to maybe change your process a little bit to make things easier on your clients or easier on you. You may change the tools that you use or the themes that you like or how you're building something. So once you create a system like this, you always want to look for how you can continue to improve it. So one of the things that I did when I started using this is we put a reminder on our calendar at the end of the year, uh, like the second week in December, that says double check systems processes to make sure that they're accurate. 
So one of the things that we've always done in our business is the last two weeks of December, um, we always shut down the last two weeks of December and uh, it'd be family time, but it's also internal reinvestment time. So we would use that time to go in and look at all the processes and all the systems we have set up and make sure that they're accurate. What has changed in our business and the way that we're doing business and the way that we're working with clients in the past year and how do we need to change our processes to reflect that so that it's accurate and it's current, right? One of the things that was really big with that when GDPR rolled out, well, now we have to go in and look at how do we have to change our processes for that? How do we have to change the education of clients for that? Uh, the email marketing basics, the ebook that we give to clients, we have to go in and edit that to address some of the things that are related to GDPR. So you want to set that reminder to go in and reevaluate and constantly look for ways that you can improve. So another quote that I love, a person who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Uh, I make tons of mistakes in my business. I probably make more mistakes than anybody I know in my business because I'm also always willing to try new things and put it out there. So when you first, if you don't have any onboarding set up, my biggest piece of advice is to just start using it, right? And it doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to wait until you have a fully automated system in place, right? Just get started with one email. Write one that you can use for all of your clients. Because you know what else profitability goes down the drain? When you're recreating the wheel with every client. When you're recreating and you're starting from scratch. If every client needs to be welcomed into your business, if every client needs to have expectations set, if every client needs to be reminded of your process, if every client needs specific information, that is something you should create once and reuse over and over and over. Right? So I created it and automated it, tested it and used it and did the whole shebang and it took forever. Um, hundreds of hours. But what's really amazing is that you don't have to do all that. You can get started by just writing your welcome email, by just writing one that sets expectations, that says, this is what you can expect from me and this is what I expect from you. Write that email and start using it with your clients, right? And then when you have time, write another one and start using it with your clients. And then when you have several done, then look at automating that process, right? You don't have to wait until everything's all done. You don't have to wait until the whole process is done, but you can get started just taking baby steps. And each one that you implement is gonna help you improve your business. The goal with onboarding, again, is to get you both on the same page. It's really just a fancy term for getting clients up to speed, right? Getting them ready for working with you, preparing them for the project so they understand what's happening, so they feel really good about asking questions and engaging with you, so they are confident in providing revisions, right? So they know what to expect. We're going to send you design concepts. These are revisions, like this is how revisions are going to work. This is what we want to hear from you. If you hate it, tell us. If you love it, tell us. If there's something that's funky or you don't understand it, tell us. Let's walk through it, right? So these are things here that you can do during onboarding to mitigate risk, to reduce obstacles, right? No, there's somebody, I don't know who said it, I don't know who said it. But there's a, a statement that says like 90% of the work is in the last 10% of the project. Which is true a lot of times when you have no systems and you're flying by the seat of your pants and you're recreating the wheel every single time you work with the clients. You get to that in the later stages of your client projects and all of a sudden things are falling off the rails, right? You realize you forgot something. Or the client asks you a question and you're like, oh, I didn't even remember that. Right? Or the client didn't do what they were supposed to do, or they said that they had something set up that they didn't have set up, or you dig into their hosting account for the first time and you realize it's a total, complete disaster and there's sites in there that you didn't even know existed. And now you're thinking, oh, now what? Right? There's all kinds of things that happen at the end of these projects that derail it, and this is where profitability goes on with it. Right? And this is where client relationships go on with it. I've had 
relationships with clients that have been fabulous. Like, they've loved every single bit of the project and we get to the very end and something goes funky because of them. But I'm a service provider, so it's always my fault. Um, and it sours the relationship because of one little thing at the end that could have been saved by better education up front. Right? It could have been saved by better expectation setting up front by providing the client tools to empower them, equip them, to be engaged in the process. Like nobody wants to work with a client who's like, you just do it. I'm too busy. Like, you need your clients to be engaged in the process to create a good work product, to create a final product that you're proud of and that delivers the results the clients want. You need them to be interactive. You need them to provide feedback. You need them to be honest with you about what they like and what they don't like and what they need. And the client's not going to do that if they're uncomfortable. And onboarding can help mitigate all of those things. Um, so a few quick tips about onboarding. So again, I mentioned earlier, make your questionnaire, if you send it to the client, make it the absolute last step of your onboarding process, right? You want it to come at the end, because the goal here is to prepare the clients to fill that out and do a great job, right? You don't want one word answers, that's not helpful. You want them to feel like, I got this, right? Like, I can answer these, I know how to answer these. Because then they're gonna answer it, they're gonna be with you in a decent amount of time and you're not gonna be waiting and saying, hey, I'm waiting on the discovery questionnaire, hey. We have your website strategy session scheduled and you haven't sent this back. If I don't get it tomorrow, I'm canceling. Because we won't hold the we won't hold the, the strategy session to do design if we don't have that questionnaire back. Right? Uh, with a documented system, again, you can automate or delegate this. If automation isn't something that you're prepared to do, or it's not something you're comfortable with doing, you can delegate this to a team member or a virtual assistant. Right, I work with a lot of people who implement this system uh, in their business uh, through a course that I teach. And some people automate it all through software and some people delegate it to a virtual assistant because they want more of a human touch. They want a person managing that and a person uh, delivering that, that personal touch with clients as well. But the whole idea is that you're not doing it. Right, as the business owner, as the most senior person in your business, the absolute best place you need to be spending your time is in strategy, is in consulting with the client and digging into strategy behind the sites that you're building, in making sure the work that you're producing delivers the results that the clients need, not in chasing down the client's gravatar, the right email for their gravatar, or chasing down the site title or some other name detail of their site that's just a little thing but then tends to eat up a bunch of time and suck out your profits. Right, so you can delegate and automate this and get it off your plate. Uh, one of the things that I wanna, that I get pushed back on from people with automation though is, but it's so cold, business is all about relationships, business needs to be personal, people wanna work with other people that they know like and trust. All of these things are totally true. Automating your onboarding system isn't meant to replace that client interaction. It isn't meant to replace your relationship with your client or your one-on-one -on -one work with your client. It's meant to supplement that, right? So we tell clients, this is all automated. Like, it's software, you're gonna hear from us every day. And I get on the phone and they're like, oh my God, thanks for sending me that email. And I'm like, I told you that was automated. And I'm like, no, but it felt like you were sending it just to me. <laughs> um, and I'm like, I, I, I will take it. But what it allows me to do is these, the automated systems takes care of all those things when I'm on the call with a client, when I am working with a client, all of that focus is on moving them closer to achieving their goal. Not on, hey, we have done all these little things, or hey, I need these other things, or let's go through all this admin stuff. All of that is out of the way. So what the client experiences is high value in all of their interactions with me. So they walk away thinking, this is totally worth the money. And when my friend says, I'm looking for somebody to do this, they don't talk to anybody but Jen. And that's where all my business comes from. It's referrals. So again, an onboarding system is all about just establishing common ground between you and your client. Right? It's about educating, empowering, 
and it could be them, to participate fully in the process like you need them to. So you can provide a you can provide a final project that you are excited to put in your portfolio and one that you can be excited to show another prospect when they say, can you show me what you can do? Right? This sets the tone for that and enables you to achieve that. Right? And again, it's reminding them that hiring you was the best choice ever and they're super smart for signing your contract and paying your deposit, even if it was probably a little uncomfortable because it was more than they wanted to spend. So again, last quote, what you get by achieving your goal is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. One of the things that I realized when I, when I uh, implemented an onboarding system in my business is I, got, I was a better business owner. I was a better business owner and I was a better consultant for my clients and I was a better salesperson because I tell you what, creating an onboarding process, figuring out what my clients need to know, what they need to learn, what they need to do, what I need to do, what has to happen, figuring that out, creating the content and putting that process together, by the end of that, I knew that breath by the back of my hand. So when I'm on a sales call, I could talk through my process, I could talk through expectations, I could talk through boundaries, I could talk through any of those things, no problem. I was showing up to sales calls more confident. I was showing up to business meetings more confident because I knew I had a system to support me and I knew exactly how my business worked. And I was winning projects over my competitors who were floundering those calls and not able to answer some of those questions as concisely and professionally as I could. So just the act of creating this process in your business is gonna elevate you as a business <coughs> owner. So if you don't have an onboarding system yet, hopefully I have inspired you today to set one up and create one in your business. Uh, I call mine Profitable Project Plan, uh, and this is all the places you can find me online. So I am going to open it up for questions, and then we'll wrap things up at the end. Does anybody have any questions about onboarding? Yes. What do you actually use? Like, what are the actual tools you're using? For, like, Mailchimp versus Aweber versus Constant Contact? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'm sneaky and asking you this, and sort of like, hey, tell me your secret recipe, Master Chef. <laughs> uh, when I first implemented it, I was using Infusionsoft. Um, I was a super early adopter of Infusionsoft when it was super cheap, um, and then their software just was crappy, so we left uh, and moved over to Agile CRM, uh, integrated with MailChimp, uh, and now I am in the process of looking at moving again to ConvertKit. But Agile CRM is the CRM tool that I use, it's where we do all our client uh, documentation, tagging, and things like that. Uh, so. Agile CRM does all that. They have email automation and things built in, but I just don't like it as much. MailChimp was super easy. Um, so I implemented with MailChimp, but MailChimp doesn't do uh, tagging and behavioral stuff as well as, well, it didn't until recently, and now they're they implemented tagging, but it's not very good. Um, and ConvertKit does behavioral tagging. So how I mentioned before that you can set things up where if a client pays if a client pays a contract, then you get this email with a reminder, or pays a deposit, you get this email. Like if a client clicks this link, you get this notice. If a client opens your discovery questionnaire, you can get a message that says, hey, they opened it, so you know they got it. And you can follow up if you don't hear from them. I can do things like that with ConvertKit that you can't do, it, that you can't do with MailChimp. So I'm, moving, I'm looking at moving all my stuff over there. Uh, and then I said, basically, <coughs> Anybody else? Yes? Do you ever get any pushback from people going through your education onboarding eight day process? Like, say they feel like it's going too slow or they just want to expedite that portion of this and expect you to stop it to jump into the project? Um, most people aren't savvy enough to be able to start a project that fast. <laughs> so um, that doesn't happen too often. Uh, if I'm doing a rush project, I have a forked version of this that's simplified down to like three days. Okay. Uh, so I, I teach this whole system and I, I sell it as part of a course called Profitable Project Plan. Uh, and that's what I usually tell people. Set up your master 
automated systems, right? Set up your master system that's for your most common project that you sell. And then you can fork it and edit it for use cases, right? So if you, like, uh, Profitable Project Plan covers uh, a custom WordPress project from, from sales called Post Launch. So if you sell theme customizations, right, you need a little bit different process than if you were building something custom. Or like our average custom project was 60 days. Well, we often will work with clients that are doing a rush project. They need it done in two weeks or they need it done faster. So we'll fork that, shrink it down, get rid of the stuff they don't need and have another version that we use on rush projects. Um, most people, they don't have time to read stuff during the week anyway. So we have some clients that are religious. They're like, I look forward to your emails every single day. And we have others that are like, I'll get this on Saturday once I have everything. And it just depends on the client. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so. Thank you. No, you sorry. No, go ahead. I'll you. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, besides, um, besides the uh, the client giving the client additional login for a uh, client portal, what were the other drawbacks that you found with that system? With which one? So you you talked about trying in like five or six different methods and you like oh, a lot of emails. Clients don't want to have to they don't want another username and password and they don't want to log into something else. That's the excuse on every other thing. Um, and the PDF version, I just didn't like it. It was too easy for clients to ignore and like click through really fast and be like, yeah, I looked at that. And I noticed they were just skimming through and not really looking at it, so I didn't like that one for that reason. Uh, but the others, they just they didn't want another username and password. They didn't want one more thing they had to log into, one more place they had to go, one more thing they had to manage and keep track of. Uh, email, again, was just easy. They check it every day. They had to do no work. Get everything right? out. <laughs> they had to do no work. They just had to open their email like they do every single day. And it just was the best. It was the best and the easiest for us. It was the easiest for our clients. Yeah, so what uh, WordPress plugins do you use? Uh, what WordPress plugins do you use to, uh, I guess, work with clients or manage client interaction? Um, is there anything specific or automated there? WordPress plugins? Yeah. For this process? Yeah. None. This is, this is like, this is client management. Right, so it's it's education and communication. Like they don't have a WordPress site yet, or well, they do they're designing it. Potentially right? after so. that, then. So potentially after the onboarding completion, <clears throat> uh, you're starting either do information gathering or you're starting to actually implement the site. Do you use any plugins on that phase as far as client interaction? To manage client interaction, no. There are some that you can install to like clients can make changes and like feedback and provide revisions and things in there, but it's not, that's not my process, right? That's not how I build. Like the majority of all the sites we build are, are more custom from scratch. So I'm starting with a white screen, I'm designing it, I'm doing all of the revisions uh, that way. So uh, through design mockups, and then once we get into development, clients aren't making any more changes or they're paying me a lot more money. So, uh, in terms of revisions and interaction and back and forth, we don't use any plugins on the site to manage that part. Uh, we use plenty when we're building it, based on the <laughs> needs and the kind of functionality that they need or, or things like that, but not in terms of client management. Uh, in terms of content collection, uh, there is one piece of software that closely mimics the process I use. It's called Content Snare, uh, and that I recommend super highly, but it's not a WordPress plugin, it's a it's a SAS app for gathering content from clients. Yes? For the profitable project plan, when does the onboarding start? Uh, when does the when does the course start or when does what do you mean? The onboarding. Um, so like when does that process start? When the client pays the deposit. Yep. So I don't do any work until I get some money, right? Like before, if you're not paying me any money, you're not my client yet, right? So onboarding starts when the client pays their deposit. You send them a contract, they sign it, they pay the deposit, you start onboarding and it kicks off the project, right? So you wanna start it when you, when you get that notice that they paid their first deposit, trigger onboarding and get that started. 
Um, I was wondering if you had any like automated kind of wrap up process when the project is finished. How do you mm -hmm. approach that? Is that also automated or is that just kind of? It's, yeah. Uh, it is. So uh, we call it our exit sequence. Uh, but at the at the end of a project, when we uh, take the site live, uh, the onboarding process works so well for us. I implemented the same thing for the design, development, launch, and then post-launch follow-up. So for us, wrapping up a project means uh, preparing the client for website launch, providing the education about what's going to happen. That it's not like just flipping the light switch. Actual, these there are things that have to happen, redirects, whatever it might be if it's an existing site. So educating them on what's going to be going into that launch, scheduling the launch with them, scheduling their training. So once the site is live, we host a, a training with them, show them how to use it, make sure that they're fully empowered to add a page, add a blog post, work with their content, do whatever it is that they need to do. Uh, when that is over, we send them uh, all their design files, we zip those up, send them all their native design files, we zip up the, the theme and everything as it was when it went live, we send that to them for their records, because um, I think I should always remain in control of everything related to their brand. Uh, so if we were hit by a bus tomorrow and they, their site crashed, they could reinstall it from the day that we turned it over to them, and they would have all the design files in case they needed to recreate anything. Uh, so we provide them that, and then we trigger an exit sequence. Just like we have onboarding uh, automated, we trigger an exit sequence that's automated. Uh, unlike onboarding that gives them one email every day for eight days, our exit sequence is one email every three days for about 60 days, and then once three months out, once six months out. Uh, and those are pre-written, and they're automated, and they're designed to answer the question I have my website now. What do I do with it? What do I do with it, and how do I take care of it, and how do I get clients to come to it? Like, how do I get traffic? Right, and it does that. So the goal here is when I'm done with the project, and you've paid me in full, I don't have time for you anymore. Unless you're going to stay on for maintenance and keep paying me. But if you're not going to keep paying me, I'm not going to continue to give you more time. But here's the thing, I want referrals. Right, I want a testimonial, and I want referrals. <laughs> I need to continue to nurture that relationship and I want to stay top of mind. But if you're not paying me, I don't have time for that. So automating that exit sequence, then getting a message from me every three days, the check-in at three months, the check-in at six months with some very specific uh, messaging in there to get them to reach out and to call us. What that does is it keeps me top of mind for when someone needs a referral. It continues to add more value they paid in full, and I'm still educating them on how to get the most out of their investment. They love me, so they have no qualms sending all their clients, sending all their referrals to me, right? Because they're continuing to gain value even after they've paid in full and the project is over. Anybody else? Yes. So, Jennifer, um, those eight days, you know, they know what, you know, a little bit of what's coming, I guess, in those eight days where they're not going to want to venture off kind of a trail, I guess, that you're leading them down. So what if they, but do you find that there are people that want to jump ahead, so therefore they, they need to ask you other questions, or they're not, you know, they're, they can't uh, kind of like stay focused for those eight days on the things that you want them to stay focused on. Does that happen? Or? No. Never. You know what's funny? I get tons of pushback every time I talk about this. I get tons of pushback from people who say, but my clients are different. But my clients are different. But but all my, my clients aren't the same, right? Because when you, when you set up a system and it's automated and you do this, there's a certain amount that you, that you have to say, all my clients are going through the same process. And people think, that's never going to work for me. Each client is unique. That's really not the case. In a lot, in most cases, you're the one allowing them to drive the ship their own way. Like when you show up, as this is my business, I am the expert, and you are hiring me to deliver a very specific result in your business, I'm gonna help you achieve that result, and I have a process to help you do that. This is how it's gonna work. Follow along, and I promise you this is gonna be easy. They're like, yes, please. Uh, and the few people that are like, I don't wanna follow your process, I'm like, I'm gonna give you your money back. Bye. And then I then I move on. Right? I have no phones. Give give people 
my money back and moving on if they're going to make my life harder than another client. Right? So uh, I very rarely run into people who don't want to be part of the process. And some of it is I talk about the process during the sales call. People ask, so what's it like working with you? And I explain those things. And if they have problems with that in the sales call, then I don't invite them to get a quote. Right? Along the same lines as that question, do you consider or do you recommend um, specifying the contracts that you have to go through my process if we're going to work together? If not, then not working together. You could totally do that. I did that when I first had, I don't do it anymore. Um, I found the lower the, the lower the fee is to work with you, the crappier the clients and the more pushback you get and the harder your projects are, right? The more money you charge, it's still a lot of work and it's still a lot of project management and it's the same problems, but they understand process and business better. Um, so as I moved up market, I didn't have to do a lot of that. But when I first, uh, when I first rolled out these systems in my business, I think I was only charging like $3,500 or $4,000 a site or something like that. Um, and for those clients, I put in my contract, this is the process that we use, this is how it's gonna work. You're gonna get an onboarding sequence, you're gonna get a, you know, design education, this is how we're gonna do these things, I put that in my contract. Um, and it outlined that process and I could refer back to them and it worked great, but I didn't need to do that as I moved up our bed. My clients just became savvier and understood like, you're the expert, I hired you, like, do your thing. So then I pull it out. Yeah. Anybody else? No? I have a question. Yes. Did you always work for yourself, or did you work for other people first and then gradually work for yourself? That's a really good question. Um, when I graduated from high school, I became a nanny, uh, and the woman I nannied for owned her own ad agency, and she ran it out of her house and she needed massive help with her business. So when her kids were sleeping, I started working for her business and she needed, uh, she needed somebody to make revisions to design work while the designer was too busy and she was in meetings. And so I got started making revisions to somebody else's design work while the kids were sleeping. Um, and that's, that's how I decided to major in graphic design. So uh, within about six months, I stopped being the nanny and I started being a full-time designer for her business and I worked for her all through college as the as the graphic designer for her business. Uh, when I graduated we, we had a mutual understanding that I would no longer have a job when I graduated. So when I graduated I went to work at a publishing company as the sole designer for a small publishing company and published newsletters and things like that and it's all well. Um, and they're like you can put your name like in the thing where it says like all the people that work on the thing and I'm like no thanks. <laughs> I'll skip that. Um, but I worked there for two years, then I worked at a PR firm as the sole in-house designer for a PR firm downtown uh, for one year, and then I went into business for myself. So uh, it's been 14 years this July. Um, Did you, you're, like I've read your, what you write, you're a great writer. So I you. actually thought you were a writer, didn't know you were a designer. Um, how did, did you study writing separately from design, or did, is it just that you just write well? Um, my mom's a really good writer, so <laughs> no, my mom's a really good writer, so I think I just have I've always been a, a decent writer. But I think the more you get into design, content is such a huge piece of design that I found myself rewriting my client's content because it was really bad. Um, and I found myself rewriting my client's content at first. And then I realized this is really terrible because I'm eating away my entire hourly rate, right? So uh, I started offering content services in addition to design services. So uh, in the last several years, the majority of all the sites we launched, I wrote all the content for. Uh, I did the copywriting and content for. And then I do paid writing for hosting companies, some under my name and some ghost writing under other people's names. Um, so I do quite a bit of writing that way. And I think just the more you do it, like I have my own blogs and things like that, but the more you write, the better the better you write. And when you write for other companies as a ghostwriter and things like that, they edit it a lot. So you get better at seeing where your weaknesses are as a writer uh, in January. So I've owned my agency for 14 years. Um, Brian's original career, he spent 15 years in the fire department, his captain was the city of West Sacramento, uh, quit when uh, he got cancer and worked with me full-time for eight years 
as my developer. Uh, and in January, ditched me again to go work at another agency uh, as uh, in business development. So he's now selling websites for another agency, and I'm back on my own. Uh, and I'm full. I'm doing full time content. So I still do some design for clients and things like that, but about 90% of all the work that I'm doing now is uh, copywriting and content development for other WordPress agencies. When you say developing content for clients, um, yeah, I mean, that is a good point I get with my clients because they're, they're just like trying to figure out, you know, how do I, how do I present? Uh, and I would be happy to like write content for them, but how do you engage with them? Like, to get them to decide, you know, what they want to, what they want you to put in, versus how much you have to figure out on your own. I mean, you try to learn a lot about their business first, so that you can sort of. Copy, you know, if you're going to offer copywriting services, it's a super big commitment because mm -hmm. you have to, you have to learn, you have to learn their business right. and their style. And their, the biggest complaint that people have when they hire copywriters is this doesn't sound like it was me. Mm -hmm. This doesn't sound like me. This That's doesn't sound like my voice. It doesn't sound like I wrote it. Uh, at one point in my business, it, for Born Creative, we were super busy, and I hired a copywriter to rewrite my own website. And I got it back, and I said, I think you sent me somebody else's project by accident. And she's like, no, that's yours. I'm like, you're done. We're done. Like, I'll pay you your money, but we're done. Um, so you still have to be very probing or you. Get the it's you have to go a lot deeper and you have to do a lot more work on that than I feel like with design. I think content is, uh, I think content is easier to sell than design, but harder to do this. <laughs> right. So uh, partly because design makes it look good, but content and the words are what sells. So a lot of people can sell website content, but a lot of people sell website content that doesn't convert visitors into buyers and subscribers. Right, so unless you're confident that your content will convert people into buyers, subscribers, clients, new leads, and all of that for your clients, then I would find a copyright to partner with instead. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Last one. Project plan. Right? Yes. Yes. PPP. Yes. When is it open? And do we get a discount for being your awesome, loyal WordPresser people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm asking what you're all thinking, so. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in the world, then we're probably, probably going to open in November. I only open, I used to run it twice a year. I'm only running it once a year now. So uh, it'll open in November and start in January. And part of the reason why it's only going once a year is it's expanding from a 14-week program to a year-long program. Um, so it is probably product plan is the client management system, but Luger's Leads is my lead generation course. It's getting rolled into Profitable Project Plan, uh, and along with the copywriting course that's all getting rolled in as well. So uh, it'll so it'll open in November and then start in January and run the whole year in 2020. Uh, pricing also changes, but I will when if you're in the Slack community when it opens, I will put a discount code in the Slack community for you. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, so all proper project plan and the leads are all being rolled in together. And then Content Camp is all, uh, it's a three day workshop on creating content. That's happening in September, right before WordCamp. Mm -hmm. Do you come to Content Camp, write content, and then come to WordCamp, learn on WordPress site. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. <laughs> Not kidding. Um, but uh, if that's it, we will wrap up with this portion, so I will be all done for today. Uh, but what we want to do uh, before we end every meetup, we try to see if there is a way that we can help people in the room. So hopefully you gained some value from the onboarding presentation for today, uh, and hopefully you found some gold that is there that you can take back to improve your business. Uh, but in addition to this, if you are here and you are looking for help in some way, you need to hire a designer, you need to hire a developer, you need help with something, whatever it is, we want to hear from you. Uh, if you have something related to WordCamp you want to announce, like the sharing content camp that's happening in November, three full days of content workshops. Um, if you have anything coming up like that that you'd like to share with us, we want to hear from you as well. And now is the time we do that to open up the floor. You just raise your hand, stand up, share your thing, 
and hopefully we can connect you with people that can help you. Hi, my name is Cameron Chips. <coughs> I am the founder and CEO of a new and up and coming e-commerce uh, company called CBDTs.com. I don't know if any of you are familiar with CBD and the industry. It's growing pretty rapidly. It's about to do $2 billion this year, $22 billion by the year 2022. Uh, we estimate the tea segment to be about a billion dollar industry within that, and I own the premium domain. Um, I, I'm looking for maybe a content provider in that area, but I also have another exciting project. I'm looking for a developer that can do some interface. I have an idea for an awesome cryptocurrency backed platform that caters to the cannabis industry. Think the commodities exchange meets to the cannabis industry. And, and the many facets of that. Um, and then I have a, another platform <coughs> that will literally double your investment every month on Bitcoin, but I need to automate the process because it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's a lag and delay in it. Mm -hmm. And if I can automate the process, it would streamline everything. So you're looking out for help with automation, a developer to help with your interface for your mm -hmm. other platform and then possibly content support. Correct. Okay. So if you do any of those things or you're interested in any of those things, connect before you leave. Uh, anybody else? Anything to share? Need help? Yes. Hello, I'm Christiana Moore. I live in Orange County. I am a lead organizer of WordCamp Long Beach, which is replacing WordCamp Los Angeles this year. So we spaced it out, and that way, we did, I did this on purpose, actually. So I wanted to attend WordCamp Sacramento this year. Our camp's going to happen two weeks after, so that we have a bit of a buffer to relax and then go to another one. Look, who doesn't want to go to Long Beach? Isn't Long Beach the awesome? Work vacation? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So um, we're, gonna, we're, we're debuting something that's never happened, as far as we know, in the whole world. And WP Tavern just wrote an article about it. We're actually going to have a one-track future of WordPress for everyone on Sunday. So it's going to be all of the abstracts, the radical conversations we have on the sidelines, nice. like at after parties and dinners at WordCamps. But we're actually, that is going to be the one focus on the second day. So we That's invite, cool. yeah. So we invite all of you to come, and we're still looking for sponsors, speakers, and volunteers. So you're welcome to. Did your call for speakers open? All three calls are now open. Nice. So you can see. No great. Oh, I think I'll be in Mexico. But uh, but uh, yeah. So if you are interested in speaking at WordCamp Long Beach, you can apply. If you want to volunteer, you can apply or sponsor. Yes, yeah. you have something. Yeah, One Million Cups Sacramento. There's also One Million Cups like all over the nation. I think Long yeah. Beach is another city that it has. Um, you know, there's, there's one chapter here in Sacramento, so if anybody wants to um, pitch their WordPress website, you know, for... for um, can you tell us what One Million Cups is, so people who don't know? Yeah, it's a way for like startup entrepreneurs just to kind of pitch and present their, their idea, their company, um, to just the local place. Nice. Yeah. And where do they go if somebody's interested in doing that? Where do they go? It's uh, on the website, online. Well, One Million Cups yes. Sacramento, you can Google it, look it up. Okay. So if they search One Million Cups, if they search One Million Cups on a meetup, they'll find it? Um, yeah, I'm sure, there, I'm sure there's a meetup on there. Nice. There's Perfect. There's Twitter, there's Instagram, it's, it's on all the social media things. Awesome. Anybody else have a need? <coughs> need a designer, need a developer, need help with your site? Well, there's more camp for that. But anybody, anybody else? No? Well, perfect. We're going to wrap it up for tonight. Thanks for coming. Thank